Stu is up here to talk about how to reduce financial stress, wonderful, and improve your confidence and mental health in the process. Little bit about Stu. Stu Person is a Senior Vice President of MNP's Agricultural Services and National Leader of Crops Services, located in the Edmonton office. Stuart has more than 25 years of experience in agriculture, specializing in the grain industry, passionate about the industry. He grew up on a grain farm and continues to participate as a producer himself. Uh, Stuart leads a national team of more than 600 agricultural professionals. I lead a team of eight, so that is incredible, Stu. <laughs> I don't know how you do it. Who serve more than 18,000 clients. So please join me in welcoming Stu to the stage um, for what's sure to be a wonderful presentation. Thanks, Stu. How about that? Is that better? Oh, there we go. Hopefully everybody can still hear the first part. So, so at MNP, we're very proud to be a, a sponsor of this uh, event. And, you know, uh, I guess I, I didn't get you the most up-to-date uh, uh, intro, Heather. So I, as we continue to grow and expand in our uh, practice, we're actually up over 700 people now that I'm trying to herd, and I call it herding cats um, some days. But, uh, but it's a very great group of people to be leading because they all have the same passion that I do to serve this industry. And, uh, and I think we do a really good job of that uh, across the country. And we truly are coast to coast now, uh, right from Vancouver Island all the way into uh, Newfoundland. So um, it's taken a long time for us to get there, but we're, we're there. We, we come from our uh, humble roots of Brandon, Manitoba. I'm sure there's a few of you in the, in the room from that area. And, uh, and we've grown it out both ways across the country, and we're very excited to, uh, to be a part of this. Um, a little bit about myself, I, uh, as Heather mentioned, I have a farming background as well. I grew up on a grain farm at Canwood, Saskatchewan. Um, if you don't know where that is, it's in the vicinity of Prince Albert. And uh, still uh, co-own and operate a grain farm there uh, with uh, Shea Furster, who's going to be here later today on one of the panels and his brother, and uh, we farm about uh, a little more than 6,000 acres up there, grains and oil seeds. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been a really important part of, my, uh, of, my, of the development of my career is to have those roots. It's not always necessary to have those roots to be successful in, in this business. It's great to see other people joining all the time, but for me, uh, having that background has been, uh, been a really good thing uh, in terms of... Uh, Keeping uh, connected to the to the industry, so I can relate to all of you when I'm when I'm talking to you on a professional and a personal level. I'm uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about stress on the farm, and as I note on the screen there, there's many forms of stress, and that's not a comprehensive list. I'm sure there's many others we could think of if we all put our heads together. But one of the things that we see in our line of business is uh, is what we would call money or financial stress. Um, we see it probably more often, uh, it's probably getting to be more common than it, maybe it has in the past. And I don't think it's any secret, anybody who are, you are involved in, in the industry, if you're a farmer in this room right now, the numbers just keep getting bigger. And as the numbers get bigger, there's a little more pressure on all of us to make sure that we perform. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about financial stress and, uh, and how uh, some of the things maybe we can do to manage that. But before I do that, I just want to set the stage a little bit. So, you know, for those of you who are producers in the room, you'll, you'll relate well to this. And if you're not a producer, well, just today you get to pretend that you are. So it doesn't matter whether you're a grain farmer or a, or a livestock producer or, or dairy or whatnot, but 
All of us uh, could probably relate to something like this. So one of the things I like to do is when I go home to the family farm, and, and I'm there quite regularly in the summer, uh, whether I'm participating in seeding or harvest or whether I'm just, just there keeping an eye on, on how our crops are doing. First thing my dad always says, he says, Stu, let's go. I'm like, well, where are we going? He's like, well, we're going on a crop tour. Right on. So we always go on a crop tour, and it kind of ticks my mom off because she's like, oh, there they go again, off to the crop tour. <laughs> She hates crop tours, so. But you know, I just wanna I wanna set the stage here a little bit, and I want all of you to just think about this a little bit. You know, for those of you who are farmers, you'll relate. So picture it as mid July. You're out there. You're touring around, checking the crops. They're looking really good. If you're where I farm, the canola's in full bloom. If you're where Sterling farms, you're probably starting to see some ripening barley getting ready to take it off and put some put in the in the maltster pretty soon and. And you know, you, you look at that crop and you go, oh man, I hope it makes it, right? And, uh, and we all kind of have those thoughts of, you know, geez, if I could just get this crop, this is going to be a really good year. And you might go home and, and have a, a nice beer from the Origin Brewing Company and, and you, uh, you know, you, you go to bed and you have a, the best sleep of your life and you wake up in the morning and you look outside and there's eight trees laying on the ground you go, what? the heck happened last night and so now you're having another crop tour but this crop tour isn't as fun as the one you had the day before and you start looking around and you go oh boy we got lodging and we got some hail and that crop that you were just hoping would you would get off the field is just not there now and it's too late for that to come back and you go oh boy what does this mean what does this mean for me? And if you're a cattle producer, maybe it was a really good cut of hay that you were just about to, to go out there and take off. So it impacts all of us when we have these types of disasters. And it doesn't have to be a weather disaster. There could be other things that could happen. We could have market disasters, market collapses, whatever. But I see this all the time. People come in to, to our office and talk to us, and, and, and it's, you can see it in their eyes, and you can see it in the way they, they talk to you, is that these types of events are extremely stressful. There's huge money on the line, and we all know that. And so a couple of the things I want to talk to you today is, how do you manage that stress? You can't take away the, the risk that a weather disaster is going to happen. That's, that's a given. We, we know those types of things are going to happen. Well, they're not going to happen every year, but they are going to happen from time to time. But how do you manage that financial stress on your operation so that it's, it's a little more pleasant, I guess, being around the farm. And when these events happen, you want to be comfortable. You want to be to the point where you're like, okay, it's okay. We can deal with this. I have a plan. I've looked at this. And it's going to be all right. So I'm going to talk about three things that, that I would recommend. And this, again, is not a comprehensive list. But these are three things that you can do. And I think it's really important, especially for the young folks in the room, you know, you're starting out, you're, you're looking at, at getting into this industry and, and uh, we're going into, in 2023, you know, if you're on the crops or grains and oilseed side, you're, you're going into one of the riskiest years we've ever seen. We've got really high input costs coming now. And so we want to be good farm managers. We have to manage the risks that come with that. And with that risk comes huge opportunity. We have all-time grain, high grain prices right now, and so there's enormous opportunity for us to, to really do well this year, and that should be exciting. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there, are also, there is also a risk. We do take a risk. We put a whole bunch of money into the ground, and we don't know for sure exactly what's coming back out of, out of that investment. So the first one is increase your level of financial literacy, literacy and ensure proper financial reporting is completed. Every farm should have financial reporting done, and I'm going to talk about that one first. So I'm going to talk about these four questions. We're going to try to answer them quickly. And again, I think these presentations are made available after the conference, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time reading the slides to you. You can take those home, and if you can't sleep tonight or the next night, maybe this will put you to sleep. <laughs> But I'm gonna, I'm gonna briefly touch on answering these four questions because I think if you, if you look at these four questions and you, and you think about them, I think it helps all of us understand a little bit more about why the importance is there. So I'm gonna actually start with question three. I too like to jump around and 
not follow the rules all the time. <clears throat> so question three is, who uses financial information for a farm and what do, what do they care about? So one of the first and key users is the bank or the credit union or FCC or ATB, i.e. the lender. So lenders want to know if the business is credit worthy. And really what they want to know is, can you pay them back? Because they've lent you some money to do what you're doing. And most of us in the farming industry have to borrow money. There's a few of us who uh, maybe don't, and, and good for you if you're in that situation. But most of us are in the, in, in the business and, and borrowing money. And they also want to know, can you afford to take on additional debt? Right? So if we're out there and we're wanting to expand and we're wanting to do more, can we, can we afford to do that? And then the last one is, are you meeting your bank covenants? And so if, you're, if you do have debt, you're going to hear that term from your, your bankers and from your accountants is you have covenants. You've got to meet certain thresholds to make sure that you're not offside and that you're not running into any danger of not paying back your, your loans. The other one, another key user is government. They want their tax, so they want to make sure there's records in place so they can calculate whether you owe any tax or not. Of course, our job as accountants is to make sure we minimize that as much as we can or make sure you're paying the most tax possible at the lowest rate possible is what I, the way I like to look at it. And then the government also administers farm income programs, agri-stability being one of them, and so they need information so they can assess whether or not you've triggered one of those payments. And the last one I would say is your advisors and you as the producer should also be a key user of the financial statements. And actually, you're probably the most important. If you get nothing else out of this part of the presentation, I just want to make the point that we should care. We should care whether our operations are profitable. It's not, about, it's not necessarily about being the, being the most profitable or being you know, the best of the best, it's about making sure that our farm is profitable because it has to be profitable to be sustainable financially for you and for the next generation coming. So you should really care about this. This is an important, important part of any business, not just farming, but any business. You need to understand, am I, is what I'm doing making a profit so that I can continue to reinvest and continue to build this farm legacy for me and for the next generation? So as we answered number three, we actually kind of also um, answered question number one, why is financial reporting necessary? Because there are a number of people that you do business with and need to use this information, including you. So let's skip to question four. I, like I said, I like to jump all over the place. What form of financial reporting is most appropriate? <clears throat> and this is one area where I just can't stress I, I want to talk about this for a second because it's extremely important for you to all understand. There's really two types of accounting out there. There's a cash basis accounting and an accrual basis accounting. And while I fully support the concept of cash basis accounting for taxation because it does give us as an industry an opportunity to, to smooth out our, our income so that we're not having wild, wildly high incomes that create enormous amounts of tax followed by loss years when that hailstorm shows up or, or that drought shows up. The downside to cash basis accounting is it doesn't really tell you much about whether you're, you've been successful or not in any given year. And for those of you who are in, in any sort of, any area of, of agriculture, but specifically grains and oil seeds, you're usually dealing with three years at a time. You've got last year's, you, you quite often will pre-buy your inputs a year ahead of time. Some people will anyway. You got expenses to grow the crop in the current year happening and you don't usually sell that crop till next year. So you've got your information for that growing season in three different years, and on the cash basis, they're going to be, those numbers are going to be all over the place. They're going to be in those three years of reporting. They're not going to tell you whether you actually made any money in that year unless you convert that to the accrual uh, basis of accounting. And so if you're taking any accounting at, at Lakeland or Olds or Lethbridge when you guys are going to school, pay attention to this part of the course because this is really important for you to be able to understand how you're doing as a business. And it ties into many other things which I, I'll come back to later. So just a few things here, and I won't go through all of them because I pretty much touched on them, but you can read that slide on your own uh, at your leisure after. Those are two of the comparisons on that. 
on the two bases of accounting. I think I've pretty much covered that. <clears throat> so why is it important to be financially literate? Question number two, and this is the, the biggie. You know, as a farmer, producer, you are a business manager, and in most cases, you're a business owner. Not all of you necessarily may be in the ownership structure of your entity yet, but if you're in the management side, you need to understand and be financially literate to, to do a good job of, of running the business. As I said, the dollars involved have gone up significantly, so we have risks. And if there's cash in the bank, that doesn't mean you've been successful, especially if you put that cash in the bank by going out and taking a loan. I could go out and borrow a million dollars and put it in the bank and say, look, I got a million dollars in the bank. doesn't matter. I still have a loan for a million dollars and I need to pay back to my lender, right? So I hear this all the time. Well, if I got cash in the bank, I'm in good shape. Mm, depends. You got no debt? Yes, maybe you are. If you do have debt, that's not very, a very good measure. I talked a little bit about this in my opening. Have you ever had a bad year and, and wondered how we will make it? <clears throat> do you know what it, it, it means uh, financially? And I want to just point out one thing here. No versus assume are two very different things. I see this all the time with our clients. I see it with my neighbors. I saw it with my dad for 20 years where there would be an immediate assumption that when we went outside and went for that morning crop tour and saw the hail damage and the storm damage, there would be an assumption that, well, cancel that combine order because there's no way we're making money this year. We're going to be losing money. We didn't actually know that. We just made that assumption it was going to be bad because, geez, the crop doesn't look very good all of a sudden, right? But there's many other things that, that would play into where exactly our financial position was going to end up. So I think, that, and that's the one thing I really find is that not knowing for sure it really increases that stress level because you start, your brain starts going crazy and you start making all sorts of wild assumptions that, oh, geez, and am I gonna be able to pay my loans and the bank, I talked to the bank last week and they were already nervous and now this has happened and oh man, I already put my name down on the new X9 and it's coming and I'm supposed to take it, although nowadays you could probably buy it and resell it for a hundred grand more and make money on it. But you know, all, all those things start racing in your minds and that's funny how the human mind actually works because it actually starts to build and get, make things way worse than it actually is. And I see this all the time where people just get themselves all worked up. And on the financial side, the knowing, if you know what your situation is or if you can figure it out quickly thereafter, it's a huge benefit in terms of your ability to feel more relaxed and basically sleep better at night. So I talked about this, you, if, you do have a, if you are financially, uh, a high degree of financial literacy will allow you to assess that situation, understand the implications, talk to your lenders early. Lindsay is here from BMO today, I'm sure there's a bunch of other people here in the lending community. When you have a problem, don't stick your head in the sand, <laughs> go talk to the lender, because you know what? They, you know what the worst thing you can do is wait and tell them in the spring that, yeah, I didn't really have a good crop last year. Could I get another 150 grand on my line of credit? At that point, you're so limited on what they're going to be able to do for you. But if you go talk to them in July and say, well, <clears throat> this is what happened. Here's my plan. Here's what I got on the go. We're probably going to need a little money come next year. Now they have, Lindsay has lots of time to start talking with her folks figure out what they need from you and get a plan in place as to how they're going to make sure your cash flow is going to work out for next year. So it's not that the stress is going to go away and totally, right? We're, we're all still going to be a little bit stressed because like, geez, we're going to be a little bit of, wow, I wish I would have got that crop. There's going to be a little bit of Oh, this isn't going to be as fun as I hope, hoped it was going to be and, and whatnot, but at least you, if you know, you can do something about it. You can manage that stress. And that's basically the point of this slide is, won't take it away, but at least it'll put it in a position where you can manage it 
to the best of your ability. And the last thing I'll comment on this section is it allows you to better understand risk management planning. And I'm going to talk about that as my second point, get a little bit more into what I mean by that. So my second uh, recommendation to this room, and again, I know I'm talking to a bunch of, some of you are already the converted, and some of you are also advisors, and so I'm sure you talk about this with your, your uh, clients, and some of you are producers, some of you are going to be new producers here. But I can't stress this enough, prepare an annual risk management plan, and, and it ties into the third one as well, as part of an overall business plan, but I'm singling this one out because I think it is really important, um, especially, like I said, is if you're going into this 2023 year as being one of our, our riskiest years. So we've talked a lot about this already today, what's going through your minds. As a producer myself, these are the types of things that go through my mind, not everything, but these are some of the little things that I, I wonder about or worry about or I want to make sure that I'm... I'm taking care of and what I'm planning. I already mentioned that financial risk has never been higher. And when those losses happen, they're deep. They can be very deep and they can be very significant uh, now. So if you don't plan and you don't put the right uh, mitigation in place, um, those can sting. And it doesn't matter. I'll talk a little bit about age. You know, you might be 70 years old and don't have anybody taking over and you're like, oh, I'll just self-insure, I'm, I'm in a good spot. Well, I mean, at that point, you're, you gotta remember, you, will, you do wanna retire, I would assume, at one point. And well, how much of your retirement are you putting at risk by not planning or by not taking the, the appropriate risk mitigation there? And if you're young and you're starting out, you can't afford to have losses right off the hop. I mean, you need to be planning that out and, and take care of that risk because you're too young at usually, and, 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 it, and uh, most of us at that stage of our lives don't have the, the financial ability to weather a storm on our own. So we got to have those, those backstops in place. So this is just a little, uh, little quiz. <clears throat> and this, this, this could also say, when would you rather test your risk management strategy? But this is a slide that our farm management consulting group uh, had put together uh, for a different presentation that I stole off of them, and you know, I don't, I don't, I hope I don't, I hope it's obvious to all of you in the room was where, where, and when do you want to test your strategy? So back to my hailstorm, or in this case, on the right, a drought. You don't want to be testing your strategy when the events already happened. You don't want to find out then that you were overinsured, underinsured, no insurance, whatever. You want to find out in the boardroom or in a meeting room or at your kitchen table, wherever you do your, your planning, you want to figure that out ahead of time. You should always be looking at this ahead of time to figure out, okay, if something happens, where am I going to be? And the tools are out there to do it. And if you're not comfortable doing it on your own, find a good advisor who can help you do that. There's lots of us out there who can help, help you make, make those decisions. I, uh, <clears throat> I learned about NyQuil when I had, uh, as I was going through, my kids were at a young age, would go to school and every, seemed like every two or three months they'd come home with a cold. And so uh, NyQuil was a great thing. <clears throat> and then I found out after a while, even if you can't sleep and you don't, you're not, don't have a cold, there's this great thing called ZQuil. So, uh, but I honestly think that in, in, you know, a lot of us and a lot of producers that, that uh, I would uh, have talked to over the years, sleep is not something that comes easy when you're stressed. A lot of sleepless nights in the summer, worried about this, worried about that. And especially if you've had a disaster and you're not sure what's that, what that's going to mean. So I think a, bit, a business risk management plan is a sleep aid, to be honest with you. And, and we have evidence of this, we, and it's not so much in the planning process, it would have been better in the planning process, but in 2010, I had a producer come in and talk to me. They, they were in a flood situation, and they, they had only seeded half their crop, and they walked into my office and they said, and they had a Ritchie Brothers 
pamphlet in their hand, and I'm, I kind of looked at him, I said, what, what is that? What are you doing? And he said, Stu, he said, I don't know. He's like, I, I don't know if I'm going to, this isn't good. I only seeded half my acres. The rest of it's, I can't get to it. Crop insurance deadline is over. What am I going to do? And I said, okay, well, let's sit down. Let's have a chat. So we sat down. We had a chat. We worked through it. At that time, for us at m &P, we were early days in the, in the, in the uh, business risk management plan planning stuff. So we had a tool that we had started to design. And I said, let's get this tool out and let's, start, let's try to use it. So we did. And after going through that process with them, we realized that with the crop insurance that that producer had, the agri stability coverage that they had, they actually weren't going to lose that much money. We're going to be very close to break even in that year. It was going to be a bit of a loss, but nothing too significant. And there was going to be enough cash flow there to actually service the debt they had. And the Ritchie Brothers pamphlet went in the garbage on the way out the door. And the frown turned to maybe not a smile, but at least it wasn't. You, you could see the panic in the producer's eyes coming into the room. And you could see the relief on the way back out. And all that was was just under, for him, it was just understanding what his coverage level was. He didn't understand. He knew he had crop insurance. He knew he was in agri stability, but he just didn't understand what that was going to mean on paper at the end of the year. Was there going to be enough coverage? And so when I say it's better than Zequel, I mean, I've talked to that producer a number of times since, and he said, you know, my sleeping just went unbelievably 180 degree turn. He said, I wasn't sleeping. I was stressed to the nines. I didn't know what was going to happen. And after that, he said, well, at least, you know, I knew it wasn't going to be great, but at least he said, I, was, I knew I didn't have to call Richie's. I wasn't going into a liquidation. Our farm was going to carry on. And I, and I you know, I don't want to confuse this uh, too much with people with, with making the assumption that agri stability is complex. Yes, agri stability has complexity in it but it's as complex as financial literacy, really. If you understand financial literacy, you will understand agri stability a lot better. But BRM strategies in general do have complexity because the programs that are out there, whether they're government programs or whether they're private programs, are designed to work both independently and together with each other. And so you have to look at and do some number crunching to understand how each of them are going to work together and there is no one size uh, fits all. It is a farm by farm process. So we've talked a little bit about that. I'll let you read that one. I talked a little bit of, uh, just, just now about the, the importance of understanding financial fluency. You know, a really important point here, and this comes from our uh, director of uh, Ag Risk Management Resources, Steve Funk, who uh, lives in Lethbridge. One thing that he always says is that uh, risk management programs are not self-revealing. And what he means by that is they're not just, you know, there's not just going to be an easy button. They're not just going to, to you know, magically do what you think they might, uh, are supposed to do. You need to take the ownership of understanding what those programs are, and you need to incorporate those into your plan. Simple, when you think about it from that angle. But it's not simple when you actually start to sit down and crunch the numbers. And so if it's not something that you're comfortable with or you understand, that's fine. Go out and get, get some help with that, because it's an important thing that needs to be done on an annual basis. Steve also has this slide that he, he likes to share in these presentations, and <clears throat> he uses this quote from a guy named David Ramsey saying, when selecting a financial consultant or financial advisor, be sure to choose one that has the heart of a teacher. And I think that's really important for all of us in the room here today who are advisors. If we care about the industry, we should be helping to teach our clients. We should be coaching them just as much as we are advising them. And so... Some of us are accountants, you know, and this slide was, was used a bit more in an accounting nature. So if you're an accountant and you're in the room, you know, you should be teaching your clients about these concepts and helping them understand so they can have better and more meaningful conversations 
and so they, they can feel a little more in charge of what's going on in their farm. But even for the consultants in the room, you can also be great coaches to your, to your, uh, to your clients. And then the stronger we make this industry, and that's one thing we've talked about at Farm Management Canada board level, we want this industry to be strong and vibrant. And part of that requires us to be strong financially. We have to be strong financially to make sure that we are sustainable for the long term in Canada. So a couple of things um, just to point out on a typical process. So I talked about that you need to do a risk, uh, a risk management plan. This is one of the ways that we like to do it. Um, doesn't mean it's the only way. But we like to start with what we would call a projected income statement. So you got to look out next year and say, look, if I grow my crop, and I'm, I'm focusing on, on grains and oil seeds, and I apologize to the livestock folks, but it just applies to, to any sector. If you grow your crop, you raise your livestock, what kind of income are we going to have? And what's it going to cost us to get that? Right? And if you look at both sides of that, that's your P&L or your income statement. What's my revenue? What are my expenses on an accrual basis? Again, if you come out of here with nothing else today, accrual accounting, right? <laughs> on an accrual basis, what are we going to profit this year if we do what we say we're going to do. And then we start to test that or stress test that. What happens if it hails? What happens if there's a drought? What happens if grain prices go down? What happens if, you know, livestock prices go down or we have, a, have an event that uh, affects the health of the herd of, of one of our livestock operations? And that's where the program starts to come in, crop insurance, agri-stability, GARS, Just Solutions, if you're in the cropping sector. They all start to come into play at that point, and you can start to build on that to say, if my revenue stream goes away, how much of that does the insurance replace? And is it getting me back to break even, or is it getting me back to uh, profit, or is there going to still be a loss? And how much is that going to be? And you all know that you have options on that. You don't have to participate in all the programs. And you, even the ones you're in, if you're in crop insurance, you can be at different levels. You could be at 50% crop insurance. You'd be at 80% crop insurance. So all of those types of things will dictate to you how much coverage you're going to have, right? So you can decide how much risk you want to take. So that's the process that we go through um, when we do it. Again, it's not the only way to do it, but we find it very effective. He, as, as I had mentioned before, <clears throat> you might, you'd likely need to pick multiple products, um, and these plans are generally only good for one year. You know, one of the things I would caution you on is if you do a risk management plan this year, don't put that on the shelf and go, good, done, I'll just follow that for the next five years. Things change. <laughs> if you did a risk management plan in 2019, if you think that plan is going to be good this year, you're crazy, right? I mean, the, the, the dynamics have changed so much since 2019. Cost of production has gone through the roof. Revenue potential has gone through the roof. Agri-stability has had two major changes since that time. That 2019 plan is toast. Don't be relying on that. It's so dangerous. And I, I get caught on this myself with uh, some of my clients giving me that, ah, I, I did it last year, I'll just follow that one. And I have to usually think about that for a minute and then phone them back and say, no, <laughs> I'm not letting you do that. If it's, you know, if it's a fees issue, let's talk about it, but you need to do this because this is important for, the, for your operation. So that was risk management. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about business planning, which really risk management is, should be part of a business plan. But I'm going to talk a little, just for briefly here about overall business planning. And again, at uh, 9 a.m. in the morning, <clears throat> these poor kids from, that came from the school probably been up since four. <clears throat> if you're not asleep yet, I might get you there by the time I'm done. <clears throat> It's not the most exciting thing. I was there. I was in all of your shoes too many years ago. And I can tell you right now, 
I was so excited when we got a new combine on the farm or we got a new tractor to drive and that was where all my passion was when I was 18 and ready to go and take over the world and, and, uh, and, and just you know, had all that excitement. I was always excited when spring came around you know, to get out there in the field. And I remember one year, Easter was in and around April sometime, and for some reason it was, it was a dry spring. And I remember spending most of my Easter holidays uh, out pre-working fields. Back in the days when we pre-worked fields. See, that's how old I am. <clears throat> and uh, it was the best Easter break I ever had. You know, and, uh, and those are exciting things, and those are important. And you've got to do that, and you've got to get it right. But, but the financial side of the business is also really important. And if you don't get it right, you put yourself at risk of not having the success you could have or potential failure if you're not on the ball on this stuff. So it's not exciting stuff, but it's important. And we have to look at it. And if we're not going to do it ourselves on the farm, then we better have somebody doing it for us or helping us do it along the way. This graph will tell a little bit of that story. And I'm not old enough to know what was going on on the far left. Hopefully nobody in this room is that old. But, but that is a pretty revealing graph when you look at that. And that is really the spread between you know, the, the blue, the top line being your, your gross revenue, and the blue being the expenses overall and the green being the profit that's there in agriculture and unfortunately I don't have the last five years so I'm not sure what's happened since then but I think we've seen some more green since then at times at least in some sectors for sure but that spread has gotten quite large and that right there tells the picture or tells the story for me that picture tells the story on you want to talk about a risky industry this is a risky industry and you better pay attention to your numbers because that green isn't as big as, as it once was. And those producers who really do a good job of managing their business, doing some planning, taking care of the risk management, consistently have a higher green section on their graph. You guys would have heard a lot about inflation in the news. <clears throat> Just some quick math to show you the difference in what interest rate hikes have done in the last 12 months, which is incredibly fast, right? So for the bankers in the room, I see Ryan's here from RBC. This is the new reality. You're out there and you have a chance to take on another 640 acres and you're going to buy that. Look at the difference in interest rate, assuming you farm somewhere where you can get land for 4,000 an acre. The Alberta people are laughing. <coughs> Saskatchewan people willing to sell are dreaming. <laughs> but that's the new reality. That's a big jump, right? It's a big jump in your cost of production. So farming practices, you know, they've evolved. <clears throat> Farm management needs to evolve as well. I'm gonna, I don't think I have it in here, but I'm going to quote, and I'm not going to get this right, so, but I, I'll get the point across. Christian Hebert, if some of you know Christian, he has a great quote that he uses, and again, I won't get it perfect, but he basically says, generally speaking, if you're farming for a lifestyle, it, it becomes, the business becomes a shitty business. But if you do a good job running your farm business, it provides a very good lifestyle. And I believe that. I think that's a great quote. I see that every day, that the people who take farming seriously on the business side, they do have great lifestyles, because generally they have more money. So they are running nicer equipment, they're taking that trip to Hawaii, and they're enjoying themselves in what they do. So a few examples of, uh, on the business planning side of what would be a flawed approach, not addressing succession fast enough. We had a succession session in Red Deer 
not that long ago. Let's talk about that. Inadequate risk management, we've talked about today. Not knowing your financial position soon enough. Reacting to that, that, that situation rather than acting ahead of time and being prepared. Those are some examples of what we would call a flawed approach to business, pre business planning. Here's some different things that float around in people's minds, and actually some of these are very similar to those clouds that we saw on, on, on when we're looking at risk management. It can be very confusing and very overwhelming to do a business plan for a farm. And so if you don't know how to do it on your own, get some help. There's lots of people who are good at this. Some of them are in this room. It's a process that you should be wanting to go through, and you should want to do that you know, once you have a good plan in place, you should want to keep that thing updated on an annual basis. It'll improve your decision-making ability, maybe give you some opportunities to save some money in some areas if you recognize uh, some, some, some areas you might be overspending. And I'll help, help you keep up with some of the trends that are going on. Just some different components that go into that. You know, we talk, I haven't talked about benchmarking today, but that's one thing you can do if you have better information. You don't have very good information, how are you gonna benchmark yourself? You don't actually know where you're at. How can you benchmark yourself against your neighbors or against your, your peers in the industry, right? Um, you should be looking at your structure when you're planning as well, and you should be constantly evaluating that. Structure is important for us accountants, we get all, we get all, we geek out big time on tax because we're going to create the most beautiful spider web you've ever seen, and it's going to result in no tax. <laughs> but in reality, you got to keep us in check on that because sometimes those spider webs are great for tax and terrible for operations, right? So don't be scared to challenge us on that saying, yeah, well, that's all great, but it's not really what we want as a family, and here's why. Got to find the balance on that. This is a really good slide, and I'll leave that one for you to read. But, you know, again, a lot of the assuming, not knowing. I want to make sure that if you take anything out of here again today, don't be an assumer. No. It's so much more powerful to know and be in control of your situation. Even if it's not a good situation, you should know where you're at. And that helps you make those decisions when the next quarter of land comes up for sale or, or the next possible uh, rental opportunity comes up if you want to expand. It also helps you when the John Deere salesman rolls in. You're prepared for that discussion. And one other thing with business planning, and then I'm going to wrap this up. You know, I, I'm going to shoot myself in the foot. I was talking about this with Kelly yesterday on the bus. Um, Kelly Dobson from Leadership. And... You know, I'm going to shoot my own self in the foot here as an accountant, but you know, we, well, financial literacy and financial reporting is super important, and we got to do that. We got to know what the tax situation is or calculate your taxes, and we got to get the information to your bankers so that they can do what they need to do. We quite often give you information several months after the, you're done, right? So if you're finishing up your harvest in, in October, November, we're quite often giving you your info in February, March, April, maybe sometimes not till June if it was a, a reason for a delay there. You should know what's going on much sooner than that. You shouldn't be waiting for your meeting with your accountant to find out, how did I do? Right? And business planning, ongoing business planning on an accrual basis with a coach or by yourself, however you want to do it, will give you an idea right after harvest or right after you're done a cycle of, of raising your cattle where you're at, and you should have that information ready so you can continually make business decisions throughout the year. It's extremely important in the environment we're in now. We can't be sitting around waiting for information and not making decisions. If that quarter of land comes up and you're not ready, how's the bank going to loan you the money if they don't know how you did? Right? So you got to have some information, and that's what, that's what the business planning process will allow you to do if you follow that through for the year. Quote in our survey, Healthy Farms, Healthy, Healthy Minds, that was done a couple years ago. Just if you don't believe anything I've said today, here's some stats to back it up. I really like this, this, uh, 
I don't like the results, but I like to use this slide to prove the point that those people who are doing plans, I think there's a correlation here in these statistics that you're seeing in terms of stress levels that are out there. So key takeaways. I skipped over that last one, but key takeaways for producers, top four things to ask yourself. I'll leave you with that to read. Those are some things I think you should be asking yourself. If you can answer those questions that you've done that, congratulations, great job, keep doing it. If you're not doing this, this stuff, start asking questions as to why not to yourself first and then look for help if you need it. Oh, and then the, uh, for the advisors in the room, same questions really, just from a different perspective. We should be also encouraging this, right? Every time we talk to our, our producers, so. That's it. Thanks, Heather. Thanks very much, Stu. So we do have time for Q&A. Um, we'll just maybe see if we can pop up the mentee slide on. There it is. So if you want to take your cameras, take a picture with QR code, or you can go to mentee.com and enter the code. <clears throat> it's a long one, but maybe take a screenshot for future reference. And I think what I heard uh, you say is don't be an ass sumer, right? Be an ass. <laughs> So Denise, I just go forward and then the questions will come in when they come in. Hmm? Oh, okay, perfect. Oh, there we go. Can you read that, Stuart, or do you want me to? Yep. Okay. Having cash in the bank is not always good, even if you have no debt, if all your equipment is obsolete and you are missing key opportunities. Yeah, I would, uh, I would agree with that. I mean, you, you shouldn't underinvest in your farm, I think is what this comment is, is, uh, is making, is the point of this comment is, and I, I would agree with that. Um, and this is gonna, gonna be a bigger issue. Um, I didn't touch on this today, mostly because I didn't have time, but digital, the digital transformation that's happening, and there's a panel on that later today, mm -hmm. we are gonna have to make some investments in the digital space. Um, as an industry, whether we want to or not, I think we're going we're gonna to be forced into it. I think there's benefits to us of doing that. Some of you are much further ahead than others, and, and good for you if you are. And I think some of you who are ahead, have, have, I've talked to you, and you've explained some of those benefits. But I think we're going to be forced into this, whether we want to or not, simply because the industry is going to demand that information be available on what we're doing. And... Um, so just be prepared for that. When you are making your investments in machinery and whatnot, you probably want to think about how that ties into your digital strategy going forward. All right. Oh, here how we go. They're coming right up for you. I'll just stand here. <laughs> how do you encourage financial literacy to those that may have their eyes half closed to the subject? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope my presentation was a little bit uh, convincing today. You know, I get it. Uh, it depends on your situation. So I do work with a few farmers who are really filthy rich and really don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? what? Who am I to criticize, right? Because they're worth a heck of a lot more money than I am. You know, but I still think that from a both from an asset protection point of view and from an investor point of view, if you're filthy rich, you should still care that you're getting some sort of return on your money. So again, I mean, it's probably not the best answer to that question, but you know, I think if, if, you, if you read through the different slides that we went through today, and if you start asking yourself some of those questions, I think some of the answers are in there. Um, I did mention this one. If you're close to retirement, your goal should be to preserve capital. 
right? Like you don't want to end up retired with no money. That could be a really bad situation. You're going to be driving the neighbor's combine until you die, which maybe you like, I don't know, but you're going to be working, right? And you shouldn't have to be if you've done, if you've done a good job, especially if you had the net worth and then lost it just because you didn't want to protect it. And if you're a young producer just starting out, if you want to have the opportunity to make this your career and go for the next 30 years of your life, again, this will, doing a good job of this stuff will give you a much better chance of success than, than ignoring it. You will get caught at some point wishing, oh darn, I wish I would have been more on top of that. So. Stu, we have 11 more questions, oh, by the way. <laughs> okay, I, better I didn't realize that. I was like, oh, is it I thought up? I'd get no. like three, so I just we stringing all my answers here. Do you need a cup of tea here? <laughs> uh, this is just a comment for the students in the room. Start going to the year-end meetings with your parents. Great idea. Um, obviously, you got to get the parents on board with that. Sometimes there's some uh, parents who don't really want the kids to know everything off the start, but I think that's a good comment. I would agree with that one. Um, get your kids involved at a young age. For those of you who are young, and can encourage your parents to bring you into the fold and uh, let you know what's going on. The more, the more you know and the sooner you know it, the better chance you have of stepping in and being successful in the future when it's your turn to take that over. You need time to get comfortable with that. Uh, using a grain farm as an example, as a general average, what would you say is the difference in long-term profit per acre in the top 25 that do what you described versus the bottom 25? Great question. We have, and Shay will talk a bit more about this today in his session, so I encourage you to go. If you're asking this question and you want to know more about it, go see Shay Furster and Colin Wengantz in their presentation today. We have farms that we are clients of MNP. We can drive down the road and the farms are on opposite sides of the road. They're the same size, the same land. They actually look the same when you, when you go by. They got pretty much the same number of bins, same type of equipment. $100 an acre difference profit between the two of them. That's incredible when you think about it. And that's, that number, that $100 number came at a time when revenue was around 550 to 600 an acre average. So now with revenue being where it is, I don't know what the difference is going to be, but that was... That data is a couple years old. So an incredible difference that can be out there. And you know what? The number one thing that we attribute that to from our observation is management. They're managed completely different, those two farms. Both successful. The, the one that makes $100 less is not going broke, but they don't go to Hawaii as much. <laughs> is, it advantage, is it advantage to take on in-debt on debt right now uh, or given the current interest rates is better to hold off. Mm -hmm. You know what, historic, if you look at historic interest rates, we're still pretty low. I think even at these rates right now, it's, if, you're, if you're making calculated in, uh, decisions to expand and, and, and upgrade certain things, these interest rates are still palatable. Um, it's not as nice as it was a year ago, I agree. But historically, these interest rates are pretty low. And so if you're, if you're finding that they're not going to work for you, you're probably trying to expand too fast or take on too much debt if you can't service at this interest rate. And I think this interest rate is a good wake-up call for all of us in the industry. Like, I don't think we're going to see 2% interest forever and ever. Right? I mean, we may go back there. Who knows? But as something like a 5 to 7% interest rate is a lot more in the norm and probably still on the low side when you look at history. So... If, if, you're, if you're looking at borrowing or investing right now, I think you should still, uh, still feel okay at these rates. I'm not sure, I'm not a banker, so you'd wanna ask some of those folks in the room. I'm not sure I'd be locking in for a long time on these rates, although who knows? If you're at a high risk, then you might wanna lock in because if you can't afford to, to see another 2% increase, maybe you do wanna lock in, but the information that I've been getting is that longer term, we might see them a little lower. Uh, what importance does grain marketing play with risk mitigation in agriculture? Yeah, great question. 
Um, it, is a, it's a, it is a risk management strategy. I don't know if I had it on my, one of my slides. If I didn't, I apologize, it should have been there. Grain marketing is one of your risk management strategies, especially using futures and hedging and that kind of stuff. You should be in, in, engaging in that. And if you don't understand it, get a coach. There's lots of them out there. There's some of them in this room here today as well. How do you plan the climate issues and carbon into today's plan? Yeah, I mean, it's a tough question. I, the, the biggest thing that I struggle with right now with the whole discussion around carbon is that we don't, we don't have, I don't feel like we have enough clarity yet on where it's going. So it's really hard to start making adjustments on your farm or doing this or doing that without knowing what the rules are going to be or where we're going to, to land on this. Um, we're starting to see some more information come out of the governments on where, what they're expecting or, or what, what the, game, the rules of the game might be. But, um, you know, I would just caution people on, before you get too crazy on spending money on it, make sure that you have a good handle on what your province is doing and, uh, and what the, the benefits are going to be both to your farm, to the environment, um, and to the overall, uh, <clears throat> the overall cause on that. So... Um, is cash accounting better for taxes while accrual is better for information gathering? Uh, <clears throat> well, cash accounting is better for tax if you're managing your tax burden. Um, I'm not going to give a lesson on taxation in this room because I don't have enough time, but you know, I, the one thing I would say is probably is actually easier to gather it on the cash basis. And that's what most people do. You know, when you spend it, you write it down or you got the receipt. When you earn the income, you put it in the bank. So usually the bank statement is giving you that tracking. If, you're, if that's all you're comfortable with and you do a really good job of that, that's fine. Your accountant can work with that and bring it to the next, bring it over to an accrual basis. But I would encourage you to talk with your accountant and start learning more about what accrual means and some of the things you want to be tracking for them to help make it easier for them. Uh, financial business acumen, ask questions until you understood the answers. Trust is not a strategy, finance is a language, learn it. Yep, I think those are all uh, great points. Yep. How can students returning to the farm ensure there is room or money for them? A great question. Um, starts with business planning. In my opinion, you need to be taking a look at what is the productive capacity of your operation. And looking at historical information is a good, good starting point to see what's been there, but you should also be looking forward on that. What are the changes you're making? What value are you adding? You know, what does it look like? If your parents are retiring, what do they need? Do they already have their own retirement fund or do they need money from the farm to retire to fund what they're doing? Because you're going to need money too, right? You got to live. You're going to raise a family at some point, right? So now, most times with succession, and there's a whole bunch of succession planning people in the room, and I don't want to steal any of their thunder, but you, you go generally from one family living off the farm to all of a sudden now you need two to be living off the farm if, if it's going to, if that's your strategy, right? So can the farm actually provide the living for both, both families? And that just starts with that last point I had on business planning and then you, you better have a good risk management plan as well if you're gonna both be living off the farm. Your take on financials on accrual base and pay tax on cash base. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> The funny part is, is for our most successful producers that we work with, most of them are paying a lot of tax. They're just paying it at the lowest rate possible. Um, so cash basis can allow you to pay zero tax. If you want to pay no tax, you can make that work. You're good at pre-buying, deferring, holding over inventory, whatever the case might be. Um, I would say that and I, and I want, I, don't want to, I want to get out of here without getting shot, so I'm going to be careful how I say this. But I can protect the, you. The, we probably, did, you know, from a business management point of view, we probably did this industry a disservice by allowing cash basis filing for tax in the, in, in the history. 
from a business point of view. Because really, if you, if you look at my dad, for example, he didn't care. He just needed to file a tax return. And that was the only person who cared. And then the bank wanted the info, and I'm not sure what the heck the bank did with the info, because they would have had to do a whole bunch of figuring to, to make any sense of it. It wasn't going to give them an idea of, of if he was successful or not. But we did a bit of a disservice there, in my opinion, because every other business in Canada files their tax on the accrual basis, just like they file their financials on the accrual basis. So they've been doing accrual accounting for a long time because they had to, right? And I think, you know, for us, it becomes an option. As producers, we can choose to do financial statements on the accrual basis, but we're not forced to because the government doesn't say, say we have to, right? So that would be my, my two cent answer to that one. From your experience, how important would you say diversification is for farmers? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's definitely, it could be considered a risk management strategy if you, you know, if one, one operation is down, the other one's up. Maybe they balance each other off. The unfortunate part is with risk management programs, it's actually not well supported if you look at it that way. Um, I find you do better in risk management if you're not diversified. But um, yeah, and I mean, I guess it depends on how you're, how you're using your land um, as well. I, a lot of producers that are mixed farms tell me that they feel having the cattle in the operation is very beneficial to the overall land. They're using the manure. They're able to cut the sloughs for hay and use up that area of the land better. And so I, I don't know. I'm not an agronomist and I'm not, not on the science side, but uh, I've heard all sorts of good arguments, I think, that, that make sense on that. I like the, uh, the Hilton diversification strategy. I, like the, I would go into the beer if it was myself. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not a big cattle person, but uh, how do you start having those conversations about risk management planning with owners of the farm operation? Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the biggest, the number one question I would ask you, you know, is what's your risk tolerance to start with? What are you looking, you know, what, what are you looking to manage? And make sure that those, those producers that I work with understand how much risk they have. So once they understand the potential downsides, then you would get into a conversation of how much of that do you want to take away? And we've got some great tools that we use that really graph that out nicely. And that's really how we go about it is saying, you know, some farmers are quite comfortable taking on certain risks. Some farmers will tell us that they've been farming for, their family's been farming for 100 years and they've never had a zero crop yet. So when we show them the complete wipeout, they go, well, that's not possible, so I'm not going to talk about that. But we have had 20% crops before. Okay, so we start there. And we start looking at those scenarios and build on that. Uh, what are the best accounting systems to keep up to date on the farm? Well, any, any computerized system would be my recommendation. Uh, as an accountant myself, I really do not enjoy handwritten ledgers that come in. <clears throat> so... If you can please put it on the computer, that's, that's a great step forward. Um, cloud accounting is the next wave that's coming, and it's, I think it's a very good decision. If you're going to go to computers now anyway, go to the cloud. Um, I know ag experts starting to, to work on the cloud on their system. Um, they would have had, you know, historically, the, the best uh, software in terms of being designed for our industry. Um, but there's other, there are other systems out there as well that are, are coming into the marketplace, and um, they're also very good. We work at our firm, we work with AgExpert, we work with a company called Xero, who's, on, who's a cloud-based platform, and we'll also work with uh, QBO, which is QuickBooks uh, cloud-based system. They're all good. They all work, and, uh, but getting them on the computer is, is, a, is a big one. Uh, and MMP, do you have many farmers who enterprise accounts? Um, yeah, I would say we do. Uh, not, probably not enough. Um, so if you're, if you're willing, if you're the one doing the books and you're willing to do it, do it. Separate out your different expenses by enterprise. It's extremely helpful for us in terms of giving you insights once we get the data because we don't have to go through the process of trying to figure it out. Um, 
And if you're working with a consultant, they would love it as well because it helps them put better, uh, a better package together from a consulting point of view because they just have more information to, to work from. So yeah, you know, I would say not enough, but I would say it's, it is getting better. How does the global labor shortage influence risk management planning? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a really good one. Um, you know, I, I don't know how impactful it's been on the prairies with, with uh, grains and oil seeds or with livestock, but I know it's been really a real problem for British Columbia in the tree fruits and, and uh, that sector. I know it's a real problem in, in Ontario with the horticulture groups down there. Um, I've been in the Maritimes, they're struggling with their horticulture industry. You know, it, it could result in your, your revenue being at significant risk if you can't harvest the crop. You don't have the people to harvest or even plant it for that matter. So I would suggest that you work that in as a risk factor if your farm is dependent on labor, uh, especially foreign labor. And programs like AgriStability uh, definitely would be, uh, that definitely would be a program that can provide coverage on that risk uh, that you're facing. I think that's it for time. Apologize <laughs> if, you, if you didn't get your question in. That was intense. Like, that was the most rapid fire. Like, Hot kudos seat. to you, Stu. You must be exhausted. 20 questions. <laughs> I know, I know who the last question came from. <laughs> I would just like to uh, make one comment. Can I have two, 10 yeah. more oh. seconds? I would just like to acknowledge the Winnipeg Blue Bombers for their generosity in allowing the Toronto Argonauts to win again. Mm. You know that the... I was... I think I read on Sportsnet that that's the 18th Grey Cup the Argonauts have won, and I'm sure all 39 fans are just ecstatic. <laughs> Well, thanks so much, Stu. That was intense and incredible. And please uh, put your hands together and thank me one more time. <laughs>